There's no place like the Cube. Family, it's your favorite queer radio personality, Anna Deshawn, and this is the Queer News Summer Interview Series. Y'all already know I've been changing it up for the summer to take a little break from the research and the script writing. And so last week, I told y'all about my 40 at 40 campaign to celebrate my upcoming 40th birthday. That's right. I'm turning 40 on August 30th, Virgo season. And it's a big milestone. It's a moment. And so to celebrate this moment, I set a goal to bring on 40 new monthly subscribers to the pod family. (laughs) You will not believe this. Last week, we welcomed 15 new members to the Q crew. Can you believe that? 15 in a week. Let's welcome Treslin, Crystal, Elsie, Kelly, Amy, Kyla, Yanni, Nikki, Dante, Shirley, Angela, Maya, Tiffany, Dominic, Bernice. Thank y'all so much for joining the Q Crew. This recurring monthly support of the Q Crew helps to support the Queer News Podcast by supplementing the costs, okay? These costs are serious. Podcast hosting, editing, marketing, travel, all of it. We tell you, if you believe in the work we do, if you are one of those listeners who listen every single week, it's like 700 of y'all. If you believe LGBTQ stories need to be amplified, if you love and respect how I report on the news and tell our stories, help me to not only reach this goal of 40, but exceed it, okay? I mean, I only turned 40 once. I got to set some high goals. (laughs) If you're interested, a link to join the Q crew is in the show notes. Family, we are still on tour as well. So do you live in Denver? Mm Mm-hmm. Do you live in Minneapolis? Well, meet us outside. For Denver, our activation is taking place August 25th in collaboration with the BIPOC Podcast Association. For Minneapolis, our activation is taking place September the 9th in collaboration with Matriarch Digital Media. So if you're in that area, meet us outside. Meet us outside. Meet us outside. Okay. All right. Back to the <laughs> back to the show. The Cube's immersive listening experience has been making its way across the country, and the people have been really loving it. It's really been an amazing experience for me to be part of, to see people's reactions to not only our work, what's coming out, but the conversations that we're having. Every time we listen to a Q original trailer, we then talk about it and talk about our experiences around that particular topic. It's been an enriching experience. So go ahead, you know, get your ticket today. You already know a link is in the show notes. Now, typically, I have a few top queer news stories for you, but I just ran out of time, y'all. The wife and I had to make a quick road trip this weekend to take our nephew son to college in Mississippi. For those that don't know, that's an 11-hour drive both ways from Chicago, okay? I just literally ran out of time to pull it all together. But I did have time to rough cut edit this week's interview and pass it along to our super editor experience, Jay, to make this episode sound amazing per usual and to bring you this really, really powerful interview that I had a chance to be part of with the Nadine Smith. So let's talk about this week's interview. It's so good because Nadine Smith is so good. She is an LGBTQ legend, and I will not read her bio right here because I do it during the interview, but please just know she is the executive director of Equality Florida who is leading the fight against Ron DeSantis, quite literally on the front lines. Like, you can't get no further to the front lines than Nadine Smith when it comes to what's happening in Florida. She is leading the team who wakes up every single morning to fight for our humanity. You may not know Nadine right now, but by the time you finish this interview, you're going to be ready to give whatever treasure you have to the work Equality Florida is doing. I promise. So stay close, because after this quick break, we'll be back with this powerful conversation. Family, I need you to listen to this trailer. I'm co-hosting a new podcast called The Head Now with my homie Adele. 
We're talking about our black experience at predominantly white institutions, specifically colleges and universities. We've got a unique story to tell, and not often do we have spaces to tell our stories. And so this is what that podcast is all about. It drops this week. Yes, indeed. August 15th. So go follow the feed. The link is in the show notes and take a listen to our trailer. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, I'm Anna. And I'm Adele. And this is the Head Nod. Season one, Black Life at a PWI. <laughs> it's an unfiltered take on black life in predominantly white spaces. Why did you choose to go to a PWI? So there wasn't really a big HBCU presence. I actually won a scholarship to the local community college and I was like, I'm not doing that. I got to get up out of here. I really wanted to go to a school and, and think of a place where I would be able to make a difference in terms of the experience. We've all got our reasons for going to a PWI. In the process, we learned some things. Ooh, especially that music. Chile. Party! What is your rock on moment? Oh man, Sweet Caroline. And the second one was Don't Stop Believing by Journey. <laughs> oh, those are songs. Nice. Those are the two we named. Yeah. It wasn't all good. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I don't know if Adele remember this, but do you remember when we decided to put on like a Black History Month special? Yes. And people was like harassing us and tearing on our posters and calling us all type of in words. And I think that was a moment where I was just like, I'm, I'm over this. It wasn't all bad. <laughs> um, I have a question. How did you know? How did you know? I did almost join a frat, but then like day of, I didn't do it. And so I was very anti-frat along with these folks, but we're like, we still want to throw parties and have a good time. So we just kind of created our own frat, which we called the U, short for the union, it was the U. But it all was black life at a PWI. And we get into it. Join us for raw conversations, laughs, and head nods as we share our stories about the black experience in predominantly white spaces. Tune in every Tuesday for a new episode wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. What has 144 players, 12 teams, and one league that you should tap into? If you guessed the WNBA, you already know. If you didn't, we'll get you up to speed real quick. My name is Money, and this is Rebound Revolution, bringing you the revolutionary on and off the court happenings in the W. Join me and a special guest each week as we watch them work. Listen to Rebound Revolution wherever you get your podcast. If you're hearing this, it means we didn't sell this ad space. If you're hearing this, it means running ads on our podcast actually can work. You see what I did there? You see this real life example? You got an event. Do you have an organization? Do you got something you need to get the word out about? We got rates starting as low as $100. Check the link in our show notes for more information. You are now tuned in to higher frequencies. We do this frequently. Turn your radio station to E3 for that decency. Listen to great music and the latest movement. Safe listening for anyone that's tuned in. Who you waking up to? Anna Deshaun, Q Crew and Friends. It's that real talk. Online radio with the spins. You caught up in traffic, frustrated. Just check in with E3 to shift your vibrations and get elevated. That's queer radio done right. Choose to be yourself. That's the only way to live life. And that's how it's done here. Family, welcome back to the show. You know, this is your favorite queer radio personality, Anna Deshaun here, and welcome back to Queer News. I am so excited today because we we are in the presence. I'm going to just embarrass her because I really do feel this way. I feel like she is an LGBTQ legend, period. And we're going to I'm going to read her bio and be even more embarrassing. But it's all very true. And I'm excited to have the executive director of Equality Florida joining us today. Nadine Smith is in the building. What's going on, Nadine? Hey, happy to be here. Thrilled to be here. 
Yes, I am thrilled to have you here on the show. And this is on E3 Radio, which is our queer radio station. So I always start with a few music questions um, because I do believe you listen to music. And it's probably questions you do not get often. And you do a lot of these interviews. <laughs> so um, I think this is like a fun way for us to get started and another way for us to get to know you. So the, the first question is, what is your go to karaoke song? Oh, that's a good one. I wasn't expecting. I was bracing, but I wasn't expecting that one. And this one is going to shock people. White Rabbit. White uh, Rabbit? Grace Slick. White Rabbit. Oh. Uh, uh, Grace Slick. Uh, Jefferson uh, Airplane. Before they were Jefferson Starship. I used oh. to. Uh, you know, that was my go-to. Absolutely. I don't even know if I know that one. So now I got something to go no. listen to? <laughs> See, now you got to do a reaction video to listening to. To listening to, you know, I, I told somebody that they got to listen to Joan Armitrade and they were like, who? I was like, I don't, what? Wait. Okay. That's all right. I'm not going to, no judgment. But yeah, that's my go-to uh, karaoke. Um, okay. But I, honestly, my, my uh, taste in music is very eclectic. There's almost no genre that I don't, I don't sample. And if I have a, a uh, an open secret that surprises people as I'm a huge battle rap fan. It is a very raw form of entertainment and it is a very, I, I, to me, Shakespearean that it reflects the realities that are going on. So to enjoy it is not to co-sign those realities, but to um, appreciate the artistry and being able to convey those realities and a lot of the positive messages uh, in a way that is gripping and entertaining and it's it has, it's sort of the least commercialized at this point. So it doesn't have a lot of funders and sponsors sort of directing it in one, one way or the other. You can have conscious battle rappers right next to the most street battle rapper, um, you know, trans battle rappers, queer battle rappers. And those voices don't always package things in the nice, polite, most polite way for us to hear them. And I feel like right now we don't need any of that. And uh, yeah. the politeness of it all, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of hip hop. So I love that. Now so, I've yeah. identified that I am uh, much older, <laughs> much older. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm celebrating more than 50 years. So I, I, I'm early to hip hop and uh, a big fan. But yeah, but I listen to everything. I even listen to country. I grew oh, up yes. in the Panhandle of Florida, so you had to listen to country music. It just kind of oozed out of the pores of every building you were in. And so that actually leads to my next question. What what song, now knowing you have such eclectic taste, like what song is getting the most rotations in your phone right now? Ooh, that's interesting. You know, when I need to get uh, pumped up, uh, you know, Megan Thee Stallion will be out there. I, I thought you were saying the most rotations in my head. What, what I'm playing the most on my phone is not what's playing the most in my head. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't get that flying a boss, you know, hello, Christ, we're about to sit again. <laughs> I said, I love you to that man, but I'm not feeling him. That is playing constantly. Oh. I can't escape it. I can't escape it. Anyway. Oh, man, I love you even more, Nadine. Let's go. Oh. And then, uh, let's go. I know this third question is going to be lit now. So if, if you were an artist, maybe a hip hop mm. performer, um, what would be the ultimate dream collab that you would have Ooh. as an artist? You know what? Do they have to be alive? No. Okay. So, well, to me, the voices, not to pretend my voice it, it could stay on the stage with them, but if I got to collaborate with voices across the spectrum, Whitney Houston. I mean, her voice is un, just unmatched. Um, Janis Joplin, because I like that gritty, that flavor she brought. Just, you know, she and Amy Winehouse kind of put that extra something on it, on it that just makes your heart break for them. Um, and then probably Nina Simone, because she can take you to the depth of everything. You know, she can be playful, she can be sultry, she can be terrifying. You know, she can name name a, you know, like it's, it's an emotion you don't know until she plucks that string. There you go. Those are my three. Let me tell you, I'm here for all three of those. And then you go in with 
Mama Nina, yes. <laughs> she just yeah. her voice is just revolutionary. I don't care what she's really? saying. It's just yeah. a revolution. Cinnamon, Cinnamon, that that plays a lot. Uh, that's my running song. That's my yeah hype song. That's everything. So okay, okay. Yeah, and this is gonna be so good. Now, family, if you don't know who Nadine is, let me just tell you a little bit. Okay, she is true to this. She is a journalist, an activist, a movement builder. She was the first openly lesbian black candidate for a Tampa City Council. And she earned the majority of the votes. Okay. She orchestrated the first landmark meeting between President Bill Clinton and LGBTQ movement leaders. Uh, she was instrumental in coordinating 93 March on Washington for lesbian, gay, and bi equal rights liberation. Today, she is the executive director for Equality Florida and has been that since Equality Florida started in 1997. Like she is all of these things. And I missed everything in between because <laughs> there is too much to mention. And we want to jump into this pod. But once again, Nadine, thanks again for joining us on the show. Absolutely. So you got a quote that says, at the end of the day, the thing that motivates me in doing this work is that I want to be the adult I wish I had been for me when I was a kid. I feel like you've embodied that. And I feel like you're in the midst of quite the fight in Florida right now with Ron DeSantis. So how in the world are you showing up every day for this work and being that person that you wish was there for you when you were a kid. Yeah, well, you know, I'll tell this to everybody. Everybody's showing up for this work. The only question is, how effective are you being in it? Like, you don't get, you know, if I left Equality Florida today, I still am a parent in the state of Florida with a kid going through these schools that Ron DeSantis is attacking, firing teachers, uh, you know, or making an untenable scenario for teachers so that we have this massive teacher shortage who is censoring books, um, whitewashing history, you know, putting basically right-wing white supremacist propaganda into the curriculum. So you don't get a pass. You don't get to, you don't get to opt out of this fight. The only question that we get to ask ourselves is, am I a victim of it or am I fighting back? You know, like, am I a soldier or am I a victim? I'm going to, because as you're, you're going to have to participate in it. And so for me, I don't get burnt out because the closer you are to the front line, the more effective you can see the things that we are doing are. Like Florida's, the headlines out of Florida, this is a governor who's done deep damage to our state. We are losing talent. There are students who are no longer considering Florida as a place to go and get their degree. There are families that invested for years in scholarships, you know, a scholarship fund for their kids who are willing to walk away from it because they're not sending their kids to universities in Florida as DeSantis dismantles it. So we're hemorrhaging talent. We hear about conferences canceling every day. So there's people who thought who think, oh, this has nothing to do with me. And they're wondering why business is down 30%. And now they're going to have to start making cuts. I think they're going to start losing their jobs. So we're all in the fight, regardless of, of whether you are intentional and focused on pushing back or you're just taking the hits and feel powerless to do anything about it. So for me, I, I can't imagine, you know, this, is, this isn't this is a Florida fight. Florida is the front line of really an attack on democracy, most fundamentally. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're all going to fight it here, or you're going to fight it at your own back door. So for me, this I wouldn't be anywhere else. I don't want to be in a dark blue city in a dark blue state reading about what's happening in Florida. I want to be on the ground uh, fighting back. And I want to call out to folks, no matter where you are in the country, this is your fight. And we have the infrastructure so that it doesn't matter if you're in, in Sacramento or, uh, you know, now I got to think of another city somewhere in Rhode Island, <laughs> you can lean into this fight. And so that's, the, that, that's, an, that's what energizes me. And, um, and I'm seeing people show up. I'm seeing students leading, pushing back, doing walkouts, getting themselves to Tallahassee to protest. And I'm seeing parents, some of them who weren't paying attention when we sounded the alarm at first, but they're wide awake now. And, and we are outnumbering Moms for Liberty at school board meeting. You know, there's an old saying in, from uh, the anti-apartheid struggle. Now you have uh, touched the women, you have struck a rock, you've unleashed a boulder, and you will be crushed. 
I used to have that up in my dorm room in, in college. And that spirit of, you know, you, you, you cross the line. And after this, having crossed that line, you've unleashed, you have unleashed a force that is going to eliminate the threat. And, and we're in that stage of this fight right now. And you are absolutely on the front lines. I believe you when you say you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And one way that you all are fighting back at Equality Florida is this initiative called Resist, right? Centered around being a parent and the fight around being a parent in Florida who is advocating for all that is good. Yeah. Equality, equity, liberation, queer folks. I know mm -hmm. you're, you're a big researcher. You're somebody who brings the news and the facts and the context uh, to your listeners. And, and I think it's really important right now that we are students of history because then we can understand why we are where we are because we've been here before. We saw it post-Reconstruction with the violent backlash against the election of black leaders in, in legislatures at the national and state level. And the corollary is it's not an accident that we're seeing this hateful erasure of black history, these attacks on the existence of LGBTQ people, particularly um, trans kids and adults. We've seen it before. We saw it with the McCarthy era Johns Committee in Florida that went through universities purging civil rights advocates, homosexuals, and anybody who was considered a political dissident. We saw it again with Anita Bryant when she had her so-called Save Our Children campaign using the same rhetoric that Ron DeSantis and his uh, machine use of calling us groomers and saying that we're a threat to children. She partnered with a group that funded her and their, their primary motivation was ending integration of private school. So the, the coupling of rabid anti-LGBTQ uh, rhetoric and an erasure of black history and the silencing of dissent have always gone hand in hand at these moments where fascism seeks to topple democracy. In your own experience, Nadine, how are the young people in Florida fighting back? Are they showing up to the city council meetings as well? Are they organizing? Oh, How are they absolutely. being supported? I, I will tell you this, you know, Parkland, the aftermath of the, of the killings at Parkland in um, South Florida, the, the, the nation saw what happened when young people galvanized, not at the direction of organizations and adults, but with a, with a spirit of this, is, we've had enough. And those of you who have, who have gone before us, Whatever you're doing, it wasn't sufficient to the moment. So to see the march uh, for our lives, you know, obviously as a, as a March on Washington organizer, you know, it, it is for me um, such a testament to the, the spirit of leadership among young people in the state of Florida. And so, yeah, we, we've seen young people take on, we've seen students do walkouts, create their own curriculum when, when DeSantis began to ban Black history being told in an honest way. So there's a lot of creativity and a lot of energy uh, that we see coming from young people. But as a parent, I also just want to shout out that uh, there came this beautiful moment. You know, New College is a well, had been a very well respected university in, in Florida, and DeSantis has systematically dismantled it, firing its leadership, uh, banning mm. courses like gender studies and others. And uh, taking existing students and putting, making them second class students in order to bring in, um, students that are drawn to the Prager U University type right wing propaganda. And when they had their last graduation, the students protested. They had their own graduation, but when they went to the formal graduation, they had their own protest. And I wondered if parents would join them and to watch the parents join their, their students in turning their back on the DeSantis administration during that, to me, that was an indicator that we'd reached a tipping point where parents across the political spectrum were finally grasping just how sinister what is happening um, and how it is part of an idea of, of what this state should be and what this country should be that they're willing to fight back against. So, so yesterday we launched Parenting with Pride and it really came out of the overwhelming, you know, uh, just sort of an onslaught of emails, phone calls, text messages, um, 
DMs we were getting from parents who were like, I don't know if my, my trans son can come home because I'm not sure he can get access to meds while he's in town. How do I fight back? Or some parents in the midst of all of this, their kid just came out to them. They never thought about these issues. And they're saying, you know, all I'm seeing in the news is this hateful rhetoric. How do I get good information to be able to to support my kid, even if I'm not educated myself yet? And then, of mm-hmm. course, overwhelmingly, we're hearing from parents who are furious. And they're like, I want to be at every school board meeting. Tell me what board of education meetings I can be to, you know, attend. How do I connect with other parents? And so out of that need came Parenting with Pride. And uh, we have over a thousand uh, families that are a part of it. And that's before we even launched. So we're going to be spending a lot of time supporting the activism of students and the growing voices of parents who actually have students in schools, not this sort of AstroTurf Moms for Liberty who are all, these are all homeschooler, you know, uh, uh, charter school, private school moms dismantling what is happening in the public education system that for the most part, their children aren't even a part of. Right. It was founded by the wife of the chair of the Florida um, Republican Party. And its sole goal was to bring culture war rhetoric that could draw um, suburban, what they used to call soccer moms, more deeply into the Republican fold. That is the stated that was the stated reason, the thing that they were looking for. And out of that came this Moms for Liberty group that is, is wreaking havoc, not just in Florida, but elsewhere. But the good news is more and more people are waking up and pushing back. And, you know, you go to school board meetings, Moms for Liberty might be outnumbered 10 to 1 now. So to everybody who's not in Florida, if you're watching what's happening in Florida, just, just understand that they, their intention, if they're not there yet, is to come for you. And please take the, the things that we've learned here in Florida to fight back and, and invest in this fight here so that we can stop them before they, they do what Anita Bryant did, which was take her hateful campaign from Florida all the way, all the way across the country to California, leaving these destructive laws in, in their wake that took us decades to undo. Yeah. I feel like we're in a decades long fight now to undo the things that a DeSantis and a Governor Abbott are doing in their respective states. Do you feel the same? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it's going, it's, they're doing deep and structural damage that's going to take a long time to repair. Uh, it, they'll be out of office and we'll still be fixing the damage. But I also think, again, as a student of history, I, I was naming the backlash that we're experiencing, but there's always a backlash to the backlash, and that's where the most progress has ever been made. Um, when they create such a clear divide that the nation has to answer the question, where do I stand? And in the aftermath of those backlashes, the nation has stood up and we've advanced. And so I think that we're in one of those moments right now where these ugly, hateful policies don't reflect the majority where they we- weaponize. Like there may be plenty of people who go, you know, I've never met a trans kid. I've never met, thought much about um, sports. I've never thought about it. It's never, it's never been on my radar screen. And now that they forced it onto my radar screen and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable with things I don't understand. Instead of trying to bring information and clarity, they've said, oh, you're uncomfortable. Let me exacerbate that. Let me feed every fear you have. Let me give you this rhetoric that will make you feel self-righteous and noble in doing harm to people. So there are people who are kind of part of the mob right now that, that will peel off as they, um, as they hear the stories and, and have greater familiarity with the targets of this hatred. We saw, we've seen that time and time again, not just with, you know, the LGBT community coming out it has always been a precursor to, to progress. But we've also seen it in places where the trans community speaking, you know, very directly to the public, making people go, oh, okay, wait a second, you're a real person. And the ideas that I've been told about who you are don't match with my reality of experiencing who you are. So there's going to have to be a lot 
more education and a lot more visibility and a lot more of the communities experiencing the brunt speaking for themselves. Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I also know that all of the work that we have to do to push back creates, um, you can call it the Streisand effect. I'll tell you very quickly, Barbara Streisand did not like the fact that her home was on Google Maps. Uh, maybe four people that found it on Google Maps, but she went to court to try and get it removed and I think was ultimately unsuccessful, but the visibility she gave it by fighting it caused millions of people to download pictures of her home. Uh, someone said you should update that to the Will Smith slap, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead yeah. of, instead of shutting, uh, Chris Rock up, he actually made, you know, gave a bigger platform for people who were critics of his wife. So I say all that, um, because I think of it this way. Uh, I think of it as the slingshot effect. They are, they are, you know, the progress we've been making, they are walking it backward. And with each step, they think they're dragging us back to the, the time when I didn't have an adult I could turn to, right? When I was like so many young people, especially in the black community, trying to navigate racism, homophobia, sexism, and feeling like there was no place where all of me could be. But instead of us dragging them, dragging us backwards, they are creating in that slingshot, the dynamic tension that when we break their grip, we're not just going to come back to where we were when they attacked us. We're going to spring forward in the same way that their efforts to stop marriage equality arguably paved the way for marriage equality because it compelled us all to ask, where do we stand and what will we fight for? Even in places where we lost. When you look at polling, like in Florida, in the immediate aftermath of our loss in 2008, support for marriage equality increased double digit and support for everything else increased dramatically. It was as though a mob had just sort of um, run riot in the city and the next morning they were surveying the damage. But I think what was really happening was a lot of people who stayed on the sidelines were suddenly aware that six out of 10 of their neighbors had gone to the polls and said, you can't have what my family has. And it made them speak out. It made them speak to family members and friends. And, and I think that's how this, I think that's how lasting change comes. And then finally political power. So, so I think that, that this is painful. There's a lot of harm that's being inflicted, but history teaches me that as long as we do the work in the midst of the fight, on the other side of it, we are paving, we are laying the, the pavers on this road to a progress that will seem inevitable soon, even though it seems very far away right now. Yeah, I mean, it seems far away. I think you're absolutely right in regards to being students of history and understanding that this is what happens. This is this is what has happened and the the need for us to keep fighting in this moment and sometimes I feel like politics can feel very abstract in so many ways and so many times because there's no good way to communicate. Like people haven't found a great way of communicating policy and how it actually impacts people. But I feel like because of all of the antis and all of the hate and, and just how blatant and ugly it's been, people do feel the impact. And I do feel like people are getting fired up. They just need to know where to direct the energy. And, and how they can make a change or be part of the change, even if that means at their own homes or in their own schools or their own families, you know, you're in the midst of it. What have you seen organizationally, right? There's lots of LGBTQ orgs out here. There's the Equalities, the Equality Federation, there's HRC, there's GLAD Task Force, GLSEN, NCLR. How have you all been working together to combat everything that's been going on? Yeah, I think the circumstances uh, you know, I, I've been around for a while, so I know a lot of the organizations who work together uh, year in and year out. But I think the circumstances are of such a dire nature that everybody understands it's not about the jersey you're wearing. It's about this movement. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm glad we have organizations that specialize. They have their lane and they bring the expertise from that lane to the fight. You know, I, I believe when you want to solve problems, you have to get very close to them. And so, you know, I would say to people, if you're looking for a way in, 
find that organization, the state organization or the local organization um, that you can plug into and be a part of. Um, again, I will say that Florida is is one of the most important battles in this in this fight for democracy and and to not see the the total erosion of decades of work. And so I invite people. We've had we're having fundraisers in California in uh, Chicago in other parts of the country precisely because people understand that the the hate that is directed towards us has to be combated, but also the solutions that we're fi- finding in the midst of this battle have to be exported to other places. Yeah. What are some of those solutions, yeah. Nadine? Well, you know, in places where, uh, here's an example. In Illinois, the governor uh, held a press conference to announce that they're banning book bans. Right. It's right. a response yeah. to what's happening in Florida, right? Uh, there are other states that have taken this moment to say, oh, you're coming after abortion rights, you're whitewashing American history with this racist propaganda, you're attacking LGBTQ young people, we're going to create safety for every population you're marginalizing. We're going to create incentives for the business that doesn't want to be dictated to by the governor out of his, you know, to say you can't do diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, Uh, you can't, we won't invest in uh, allow our employees a uh, retirement fund to invest in anything that protects the environment or, uh, you know, all of these things that DeSantis has done. Other governors have said, okay, that we'll, we'll, we will scoop up the talent that you're throwing away. We will open our doors to the opportunities you're closing. Uh, we're going to go compete for conferences that we didn't have any grounds to compete on because we don't have beaches. We don't have this. Now you've made us competitive again, so we're going to go after them. So I think what, uh, so we're beginning to see, I think most recently DeSantis having gone after Disney is now saying, oh, I'm, I'm not concerned about that fight. Don't forget, my wife and I got married at Disney World. Like he's going to try and rewrite history the way he's tried to whitewash, uh, you know, American history in, in our schools. So the more, Pressure. We, we are seeing more, more uh, like in, a, in Utah, they somebody tried to introduce a, a don't say gay bill and ended up in the end taking out the language from Florida, the cut and paste language, saying we don't want to go down the same road as DeSantis. And I think what you were seeing right now is that he is increasingly being isolated as um, as somebody who, um, you know, positioned himself as sort of Trump Jr. But as people get a closer look at him and look at the wreckage he's leaving behind in Florida, they're going, nah, we, eh. hard pass, right? His campaign is collapsing. This is, I think they're on their third or fourth reboot. So those are the things that are working, continuing to define DeSantis, not by his, you know, talking points, but by what's actually happening behind the press conference he's holding. People are seeing the smoke and the rubble from our schools. They're seeing the drain of talent. Um, even Nikki Haley, um, you know, it's not just Democratic governors who are coming to compete for the, the people and the talent and the companies that DeSantis is alienating. I think Nikki Haley inv- invited Disney to relocate to South Carolina. So um, I think that's part of what I think the tide is beginning to turn in Florida. Now, somebody says uh, once he loses the presidential, he will come back. You know, like a, you know, like an uh, an angry drunk returning, you know, who, mm-hmm. who comes home to kick the dog, beat the kids, and slap his wife, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So, I think people are kind of like his ego and his pettiness and his thin skinned yes man universe that he lives in. Um, he's not taking he, he he will inflict more harm on Florida, but honestly, I he he has already inflicted so much harm. That I, I don't know what there is left to break, mm-hmm. but again, um, he will continue to isolate himself in his sort of delusional bunker. Um, and every day, more and more people, including people who were DeSantis supporters, are kind of going, no, this guy has gone, he has gone too far. And now I see the, now I see the damage I couldn't see before. And I try to remind people that we all know that Niemöller, Reverend Niemöller, quote from from uh, Germany you know first they came for the trade unionists 
and the, you know, then they came for the Jews, then they came for the, you know, but I wasn't them. So I didn't say anything. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak. So we all know that. And we, we often invoke it, but a lot of people don't realize that, that Reverend Lee Muller was a Hitler supporter at the beginning, a very, uh, adamant Hitler supporter. And he had to go through an evolution, um, of understanding to become a critic. And in fact, he barely escaped death. He was in jail awaiting death row when liberation forces, you know, toppled, toppled Hitler. So right now I know that there are people who have been, who rode with DeSantis, who are beginning to wake up to the fact that what he is doing is not just going after, you know, portions of the population they, they don't care about, but what he is doing is deep and structural damage that will have a negative impact on all of us. Yeah. I, I saw a video of a teacher in Florida who was um, someone had just gone through their library and pulled all the books off the shelves that um, DeSantis has deemed uh, inappropriate. And there were just boxes and boxes of books. And it just broke my heart of like, what is happening here? And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful there's an equality Florida doing the work because the impact that he's having um, is causing so much harm. But it is so encouraging to know that there are people like you and people in Florida who are fighting back and not standing for it and showing up at city council meetings and, and putting on the pressure so that when it's time to get him out of office, it's going to be the, the work of the people that gets it done, I feel like. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I want to shout out a lot of local organizations, a lot of, you know, we partnered in, in launching Parenting with Pride with a number of national organizations, our press conference announcing it, had leadership from local organizations. Everybody, you know, this is an all hands on deck moment. We need every ounce of talent, every every single, you know, uh, penny of treasure that can be donated to this fight. And I want to encourage people, go to equalityflorida.org and you can find out the ways that you can be of support no matter where you live. And with the parenting program, Parenting with Pride, uh, I'm, yeah, parentingwithprideflorida.org, you can, you can check out what's happening there and you can see all the partner organizations that are a part of it. Everything we create that's effective, we share. Everything we create that's not effective, we stop and we share the lesson, we learn from it with all of our state partners and all of our national um, our partners as well. And... Um, I think that there's a tremendous amount of talent, a tremendous amount of ingenuity. People should be clear eyed about the danger of this moment, but also filled with hope that comes when you, as I said, get closer to the front line and it, it, it will inspire you because you see people who never stood up before, like the dad who said, I never imagined I'd be one of those dads that spoke at school board meetings. But I also never imagined I'd find a suicide note for my son. And it's like, it doesn't get any more basic than that. And as a parent, um, yeah, there's no quit in me on this fight. Because now they're coming after our kids. And I am going to be the adult that should have been there for me when I was a kid. Alone, isolated, uncertain of my place in this world. We're going to make sure every kid knows that we're fighting like hell. And that there is a place and there'll be a better place in the world for them. And we're grateful for it. Okay. Thank you, Nadine, for joining us today. All right, my friend. Thank Thank you, you. friend. Appreciate you. I'll enjoy that. Did you enjoy that conversation? I'm telling you, I knew. Are you pulling out your wallet? I knew you were. I knew you were going to make a donation to Equality Florida. Don't worry. I made it real easy. A link is in the show notes right now. Mm -hmm, I know. (laughs) But I also know it's time for us to close out the pod. And you already know we close out the pod with a word because Anna's always got a word. And this week, the word is walk by faith. And this is the word. It's actually written on a hat that I'm wearing right now as I record. It's one of my favorite hats that I wear. And I've been wearing it all week as we prepared for this faith journey that I'm on. 
of going to 40 and also taking our nephew's son to college. And this life journey that I'm undertaking and to be an entrepreneur and to live out my dreams in real life, it's all about faith. Like every single step of it. Every time I wake up, I'm trusting that God's already made a way. This way of life it can be really unsettled. <laughs> like, unsettling, y'all, for real. I never knew I'd miss that paycheck so much every two weeks. It came like clockwork. I didn't have to question it, didn't have to worry about it. It was just going to be there. You know, you can, when you schedule your bills, can we talk about some privilege around where you can just schedule the bills? You don't, don't got to think. Let me tell you something. Three years ago, I turned automatic payment off. You feel me? But when you try God, when you try stepping out on faith, and you learn that the divine has been carrying you the whole time, that the ancestors already prayed for you through this moment, that your own actions, but let's be clear, right? Faith without action is dead. So when you make a move and you are active and you are walking and working in what you are called to do, when you end up in the moment, in the end, you realize you're okay. You start building up this faith muscle. I like to say that faith is a muscle because that's how I think about it. Because if you don't practice it, if you don't try it out, it get real weak. And then when you try to call on it, you don't know what to do. You don't know the first thing to do. But when you keep practicing your faith, right, you keep working on it, you sort of start building it up like a bodybuilder. Your biceps start looking like a bodybuilder, you know? And that's what I'm working on. Mine don't, you know, my bicep don't look like Pee Wee Herman no more, you know? It's like a sort of like a fit human. <laughs> and every single day I wake up, I'm building up this muscle. So I'm telling you, family, walk by faith, you know? Walk by faith. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'll continue to do. And we're just going to see where this journey takes us. But I know this. If y'all keep listening to this pod, we're going to be okay. So I'll see y'all next week, okay? Peace. If you enjoyed what you heard, rate and review us inside your favorite podcasting app. This podcast is written and produced by me, Anna Deshawn. Podcast editing by Experience J of Just Listen Media. And brought to you by E3 Radio, your number one queer radio station playing queer music and reporting on queer news in high rotation.